Great to have you. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here. Yeah, I think everyone's very keen to hear your career path stories in general, and we have limited time, so I, I would like to start. Um, Marisa, you started your career in your uh, PR agency, I think mm -hmm. before getting your MBA and uh, joining uh, AB InBev. Could you tell us a little bit about your career path to date? And also what made you uh, move from PR and move into marketing and advertising? Yeah, for sure. So I, I can go back to pre AB and Bev. I've been here about just over four and a half years, five years in July. Um, and right out of college, I was thinking about journalism and kind of, um, you know, industries adjacent to journalism. Media is obviously a very tough industry, as we all know. Um, that's what kind of landed in PR. And that's where I started to get interested in brands. And so I was working with um, mostly CPG and tech brands, uh, 3M, a couple brands within there, as well as um, LinkedIn, Zynga Games, a couple of other kind of online um, clients. And what we did there was some brand building. But I think the main thing that I found was agency life was really amazing because I got to work with so many different types of clients, but I fell a little pigeonholed in PR and I wanted to learn about the whole business. And so that's kind of brought me to business school at Columbia um, where I got my MBA and I wanted to think about what are all the things I don't know about the business that will help make me a better marketer. So I really went to Columbia with the intent of learning about every single other part of the business, except for marketing, knowing that that's something I could potentially get on the job. And that's kind of what brought me to AB and Bev. Um, so essentially I was exploring roles in brand management as almost a second marketing education after my MBA program. Um, I went to many, many company presentations and Anheuser-Busch, AB and Bev just stood out to me as among the CPGs as a place where I could not only get that fundamental brand management education at a company, but also have this real spirit of ownership, entrepreneurship, and meritocracy. Um, and I think the third thing that really drew me to AB and Bev was that beer is a lifestyle brand at the end of the day. So you can go to a CPG company and kind of be put on any type of brand, but knowing that you're doing beer, you're working with a commodity that's also a lifestyle brand, which is, was very appealing to me. Um, so I interned on the Budweiser US team between first and second year of business school and four and a half late years later, five and a half years later, I guess, um, I've been on that Budweiser team ever since, uh, starting first working on experiential, then leading our commercialization. So really bringing our products to market with the sales teams and regional teams for about two and a half years. Um, and for the past year, I've been leading creative communications for Bud here in the US. So that's essentially all of our advertising, social, digital print, any medium that we're in, that's what my team does. That's great. So within the last um, five, six years, we've experienced quite a lot of things, even within the AB InBev and Budweiser uh, business, right? That's really Yes. Great. And that's very much the spirit of the company. Um, you know, as soon as you start to master something, move on to the next role, they want us to be kind of have our toes in everything um, so that when we become, you know, the head of a brand or even up into the C-suite, you've experienced all facets of the company. I think that's something that that's it apart. You know, if you can do marketing, you can do finance, you can do sales, you yeah. can really do whatever you want. That's great. It, uh, more to the audience. Um, we have a 10 minute Q&A session. I forgot to say it up front. So please feel free to put um, your questions in the Q&A uh, widget there. Uh, and then I'll ask questions at the end to Marisa, but I still have more questions for Marisa. <laughs> um, second one, I mean, you mentioned about joining AB InBev, you know, as an MBA intern, right? I think it was the first uh, you uh, went in as an intern uh, in the internship in 2015. And then was, again, the time of five to six years, you really progressed in your career. And now you're heading up uh, the creative communications of advisors in the US. It's one of the most high profile marketing jobs in the industry. Now, I think it's an aspiration for many people, many women as well. I mean, that the, the career path that you've taken so far is, is aspirational. And are there things that Budweiser has done to help you along the way that uh, the other companies could learn from potentially? Yeah, so I only have the experience in terms of big CPGs at 
AP, AB and MEV, so I can only speak to what I've learned here. But I think the thing that really drew me to the culture and turned out to be true is you really can move as quickly as you want to at this company. So if you feel like you want to be fast tracked, you want to push yourself and really put in the extra time, you absolutely can do that. And there's really no set career path within the company. Um, you kind of just navigate in a way where you're exploring what you think is of interest to you and what's going to lead you to your goals in terms of professional development. So I definitely think this culture of meritocracy and moving as fast as you're willing to work is really an amazing thing that's unique about AB InBev. Um, and I also think we move very, very, very quickly. So you can accomplish a lot in a short amount of time. Even in this past year, I we ended up launching 36 campaigns in just one year. So we do a lot with a little amount of time. Um, and I think we also very much have a company culture of dreaming big. So no, no good idea will go unfunded, will not launch. Every good idea will happen. And just knowing that mentality, I think has allowed me to kind of accelerate my career and just do crazy ideas because I knew that if there was the business case, they would be well received and we'd be able to launch them. So there's a lot of kind of unique aspects of the culture that I think allow you to move very quickly um, within the company. Okay. So you know, we're, he we're here today to talk about women in marketing and the audience for beer brand is traditionally more male. Uh, mm -hmm. But I know from the data that I got that, that about 75% of the brand marketing team is, is uh, led by women at Budweiser US. So has this had any impact uh, on the way Budweiser thinks about its audience and approaching its marketing? Has that had any impact? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, we do have, uh, of the leaders on the Budweiser US marketing team, we are 75% female, which is something I'm really proud of. Um, and I think something we talk about a lot on our team is diversity of thought. And I think everyone's talking about that right now, right? But I think that has made us a stronger brand over the past few years. A number of us have been on the team for four to seven years, which is a bit unusual at ABI, usually you move around every two years. And I think that's allowed us to really say, okay, what are these different audiences that we haven't been speaking to for the past few years that we can focus in on? And the end result has been that actually in 2020, we found ourselves growing with younger demos, with minority demos in a way that we haven't been. And that's both sales and brand health. And so for us, I think whether you can attribute that to there being women on the team or more diversity in general, um, we really just have a culture where we are encouraging diversity of thought. And I think we've seen that play out as we try to do more and more to reach all different types of consumers and make sure that what we're marketing to is thinking about both who our current consumer is today, but also who we want that to be in the future. Yeah, and I mean, I think it's really interesting, insightful that every business, right, and regardless of the category, are very much pivoted and shifted in the way of reaching out to customers, um, mm -hmm. you know, in the marketing space and also in a store environment too. But are there specific things that you and the team, you know, in, in your role right now in the creative communications world that you really um, looked at and really prioritize? It's because, especially yeah. on the pandemic and the virtual environment that we all live in. Yeah, I think um, something that we've been honestly focused on for the past probably four years or so, but I think very much came to a head in 2020, uh, was how can we humanize the brand? And so Budweiser is America's beer. We represent America in a way that really no other brand can. So there's so much meaning behind who we are as a brand beyond just being a beer. Um, and when we started to think about how can we humanize the brand versus being seen as kind of this gigantic beer. Um, it's all about celebrating ordinary people doing extraordinary things. That's what's so important to us. We can go and celebrate the everyday American in our unique way. And so that's kind of a journey we've been on for the past four years that I think last year in 2020, we really were all about celebrating ordinary people doing extraordinary things all throughout the year, giving back, showing that we're a brand with purpose. And that really came to life primarily through our earned media campaigns that we launch on digital. And then on TV, we were really focused on the product. Um, and I think that's kind of propelled us into this space where the brand affinity for Bud is so strong. People feel this connection to the brand, an emotional connection that they didn't used to have. Um, and I think that's more important than ever, I think in this very, difficult time people want brands to take action and stand yep. for something you can't just kind of sit back and hope people will still want to want to associate themselves with your brand yep because a big role for a brand to play uh there 
Now we live in the COVID-19 uh, you know, uh, world and still challenging reality for all of us, um, but we also know that there'll be an end to this pandemic and there will come a day where we get together with our friends and families and colleagues and we'll go to bars and restaurants and have a beer, right? So without giving anything away, how are you thinking about being ready for that big moment or big phase? Yes. Well, there's the obvious point, which is there isn't going to be one day where we reopen the whole country, right? So everyone's kind of monitoring to figure out what is this timetable going to look like? Suddenly it's accelerating, you know, does that feel safe? But what I can tell you is that this is very, very much top of mind for us. And I think hopefully some of you saw that this year for the first time in 37 years, Budweiser actually sat out airing an in-game Super Bowl ad. And we took those media dollars and we donated them to the ad council and their partners who are spreading vaccine awareness and education. So for us, thinking about how we all get back together safely, which really the answer is the vaccine, um, that is extremely top of mind. So first, in place of a traditional Super Bowl ad, we launched a digital ad called Bigger Picture where we celebrated all those moments that happened over the past year that really just showed ordinary people doing extraordinary things and had a call to action at the end around getting the vaccine so that we can safely be back together and have beers together again. So this has been a huge priority for us. Coming out of the gates with Super Bowl, you know, we're about three weeks out from then. We're thinking about our next steps, but we are extremely entrenched in this thinking about one, how can we play a role in actually bringing people safely back together? And then once people are vaccinated and they can be back together, how can we just celebrate? It's just that simple. Um, most of us have not been able to have a beer with our friends in a very long time. So there's gonna be a lot to celebrate once we hit that point of being able to do so safely. So we're kind of in the space mm -hmm. right now of how do we help America get there? And then yeah. we'll celebrate. Yeah, when would you say, you know, from your own perspective, like when things will, not overnight, but in America, like where people will be able to come together. Would you say like late summer at the moment? Is that like the discussion going oh on? Oh my God. I mean, I, we're definitely targeting sooner than that. I can tell you <laughs> that. I think we're, we're feeling optimistic. Um, and I think as we see how this messaging plays out around get, going to get the vaccine and how received, how well received that is, I think that will help inform what will be time to really encourage people to get back out there and get back together. But that is the million dollar question right now. Is I know, that's why I, I, I threw it at you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, this is International Women's Month, as we know, and mm -hmm. uh, the theme this year is choose to challenge, right? Mm -hmm. So what are some of the norms in our industry that you think we should challenge to make things easier for women today and in the future? Yeah, it's a very, very good question. I think what I love to reflect on is all the amazing women in my life and the advice that they've given me. And I think um, something that's been amazing about working at ABI and having so many female leaders is we're very much encouraged to speak your mind. Don't sit back if you have something to say, even if you disagree with other people in the room. And I think sometimes for women, um, we, we tend to wait for our turn to speak and let the men go ahead. And I think something we've done that's been great at AB is really just encourage this, this culture of getting out there, having your voice heard, and even beyond that, um, self-promotion. So that that is, at the end of the day, a big part of being successful at any company in the marketing industry. And I think sometimes as women, we tend to not self-promote as much as our male counterparts. And I've been encouraged to really get out there and you know, talk about the work that I've done and be proud of that work. And I really encourage everyone else to do that as well. There's no reason why we shouldn't be doing it just as much as men. Um, so I think that's been some great advice that I've been given is that even though sometimes it can be a little uncomfortable, it's okay to get out there and show off a little bit and network and self-promotion can get you just as far. Yeah, that's great. And that was actually one of the, uh, the next question too. We get um, advice um, along the way, you know, throughout our career and some are great, some you reflect and go, mm, I choose not to take that advice, but you know, of all the advice you've gotten so far and from your mentors and networks and you know, has there been the one that you kind of, you keep close to your heart? Like you think about it when you go through both good and the bad and tough yeah. time? What would Absolutely. that, which advice do you kind of, do you think of? I think a piece of advice that I was given quite a while ago and I can't even really remember from who to be honest, but has served me really well is that, 
if you're the person who is always solutions oriented, if you always come with an idea, a proposal, even if you have no idea what's going on and you're convinced your way in is the wrong one, having that solutions oriented kind of positive dream big mindset, it's infectious and leaders will notice, the people on your team will notice, peers will notice. So that's been a really powerful piece of advice that I've gotten is that just come with a solution, even if you don't know if it's the right answer, you can ask questions, but really having that solutions oriented mindset, I think has been a really big asset for me throughout my career and something that I always encourage my team to have as well. Yeah, that's great. I think one of the best advice I've got is, you know, you can say things in meetings, uh, you know, your point of views and things, but asking really good questions mm -hmm. uh, can uh, raise your presence and also being able to contribute to the meeting meaningfully, right? So it's not always about saying for the saying for the sake of just talking in a meeting, but it's actually really thinking critically about and posing questions can be quite effective as well. And that was a very helpful piece of advice I got in my early days in my career. I um, absolutely agree. And I remember that. So now talking about advice, um, you know, do you have any words of wisdom of your own, right? That you like to share with the audience, women or men? Mm -hmm. um, who would like to replicate your success in their own career. I mean, you definitely have, you know, had a focus. I went into PR agency, you did your MBA, you came back, you knew what you wanted to do, but within, and within Budweiser's, uh, you know, team in the US, you experienced a lot of things and you probably raised your hand to want to do those things mm -hmm. too, right? So if you can kind of reflect on that and give, you know, what would you, yeah. you let's see. Absolutely. I think kind of my advice is a bit of a culmination of everything we've spoken about. So, you know, the first was for me coming out of business school, I knew I wanted to do brand management. And then once I got there, kind of establishing what my ideal pathway in the company would be. And then to your point, kind of raising my hand and saying, okay, I know I'm doing this role now. What do I need to do to do this next role? Because that's going to be what gets me to the next step. And not being shy about that because particularly somewhere like AB and Bevin, probably many companies where there is no set path that you should be going on, you have to figure that out for yourself and figure out, okay, if I speak up and say, this is really what I want to do, how can I position myself to get there? And people will help you get there if you're vocal about it. Um, so that's one piece of advice. I think the other advice I give to absolutely everyone is just network. People love to talk about themselves. They love to talk about their jobs. I think sometimes um, people when they're looking for a new job might feel as though they're bothering someone, especially during the pandemic. But in fact, it's, it's easier than ever to network. And in my experience, it's usually a 99% acceptance rate, whether it's just people I admire or alumni from the schools I went to. Um, it's just the easiest way to get your foot in the door and people will always remember that you were someone who came and expressed interest in them if you have any interest in working at their company as well so really encourage everyone to continue networking even during the pandemic where you might have more time to do it even though it's a bit more awkward over zoom um i think that's the best way to get yourself out there and at the end of the day we're all marketers right so you have to be marketing yourself constantly Yep, and I'm adding one question that's not even in my sheet of questions, yeah. <laughs> but I think it's, it's something that I, I thought about and it's good to ask. Um, I wanna hear from you, you know, I, um, we haven't talked about it either, but you know, we talk about our own superpowers, being very authentic and being true to yourself. And I had uh, uh, an opportunity to facilitate another panel session the other day and one uh, lady uh, leader was saying that hers is empathy and action, right? I mean, you gotta take action, but you gotta take people along with you on the journey. Mm. And that starts with having the empathy and being able to open up and also listen, proactively listen to what people think and feel. Yeah. Um, at the end of the day, you can be a great leader, but not alone, right? It goes uh, by taking the team 100%. journey with you. So in that context, what would, what would you say your superpower is or are? Uh, or yes. what's really important to you in, uh, in being a leader in your organization? That is a great question. I think we've been talking a lot about empathy as leaders at ABI over the past year. I think it's been, you know, the perfect case year of really exercising the understanding that you have no idea what's going on in people's lives behind the scenes. And so if someone seems off or they seem like just unhappy, disgruntled, but you can't place why, just ask people what's going on. And so I think there's something I pride myself on with my team is it is empathy, but it's also a bit of self-awareness of when the someone is 
seeming off, just ask them what's going on. Are you okay? Do you need some time off? I think this has been, this year has been the ultimate, ultimate test of, um, everyone in every which way and this the struggles that everyone has seen outside of work in work being remote needing to connect with others so I found that that's been a very powerful tool this year is simply just checking in with the team and asking if you're okay and giving people the space to take time off if mentally this pandemic and this environment has been too stressful sometimes it's completely divorced from work and you just need to have that real conversation with people so I'd say my superpower for the past year has been self-awareness that has led to empathy with my team. That's great. And um, also for me has been um, learning a lot of things that I, I took for granted that I knew, but I don't. And really starting with asking questions or, you know, learning about it myself, right? Self-educate first. Yes. And raise that awareness as well. So it's true. Now I will move on to the Q&A questions and um, please keep it coming. I have two, so we'll start uh, with the first. I don't know if Marisa, you see it, but I'll read it. I do, you. yes. Yeah. So what, what has AB and Bev done in audio and what are they looking to do in the future, specifically in anything interactive or aligned with smart speaker platforms? That is a very good question. Um, we, so I'll speak for, I lurk just on Budweiser USA, the Budweiser brand team. So I'll speak specifically to that. Um, beer and alcohol, but particularly beer is extremely regulated. So the way that you might use a smart speaker to say, you know, add Tide Pods to my grocery list. It's a bit trickier with alcohol in terms of how you go about that. Um, I won't get into all the weeds, uh, but essentially we can't necessarily have a deal with Amazon where we're saying every time someone says add Budweiser, it should be from Walmart or walmart.com or whatever because beer isn't exactly sold online in every state. So it's highly complex. All of that being said, we've done some fun things in the past um, specifically with Amazon and Alexa around trying to get the phrase what's up programmed in to mean certain things. Um, and also we're still very much exploring um, kind of that smart speaker mentality with alcohol, but full transparency because of how regulated we are, we've had some difficulties kind of breaking into that space the way that other brands have. So I'd say I, my answer is we started playing around with using phrases and identities related to the brand, but we haven't Quite been able to figure out how to tie that to sales yet with all the regulations we face in alcohol okay great um so, oh we got a third question too but i'll do the second one first so budweiser has done a great job taking action and taking a stand but that is easier said than done what advice do you have for brands wanting to take a stand but knowing it is an uphill battle such a great question, man. I've learned so much about uphill battles for taking a stand over the past year, let me tell you. Um, the interesting thing about Bud, again, it's such a rich brand. It literally stands for America. So anytime anything momentous is happening in the country, we're like, oh, we need to jump in, like the vaccine, this equal rights movement. We essentially have the right to play in so many different territories that the first step for us is to say, okay, what are the pillars that we want to own the most when there's so much going on in the world right now? So for example, right now, we're all about vaccine awareness. We are the leader for a brand in that space. At the start of COVID, we were all about bringing everyone together with our one team campaign and helping the Red Cross with much needed blood donations. So really thinking about what's our authentic way in. And for example, with our Super Bowl campaign, us sitting out Super Bowl and providing our marketing kind of resources to vaccine awareness, that's so unique to Budweiser because we're so intrinsically tied to the Super Bowl. So when it came time to talk to the higher ups and say, we wanna sit out Super Bowl this year and instead you know, give that money to vaccine awareness, because that was so authentic to Bud to do something altruistic instead of going to Super Bowl, that's just so in our brand DNA and being able to lend that marketing power to um, the most important thing of our generation, probably the vaccine, it was easy to get that approved. Now, I will say that probably the hardest part when thinking about more sensitive topics that we've chimed in on over the past few years is making sure your brand's way in doesn't seem like you're kind of bandwagon 
jumping on jumping on the bandwagon. Um, I think every brand has had some missteps in the past, and the reality is there's so many cultural moments that are shaping shaping us right now as brand marketers that you don't need to chime in on every single one. So really identifying, okay, what are those moments where I can come in a way that's ownable exclusively to my brand. This isn't something that any other beer brand could do. That's kind of the filter we put on. Um, it's particularly more kind of sensitive or provocative topics before we start exploring entering in at that moment, because we tried to do every everything that's happening in American culture. We would just kind of come off fake. You have to pick your battles a bit. Yep. That's great. Um, so Lauren's asking, I love that Budweiser is advocating for vaccine option, which uh, you also touched on now. How's the brand tracking success around that effort? If Can you tell me a little bit about it? Oh, yes, that's a great question. So we, we've, we're we doing a couple studies right now to understand that, you know, who were, I think when we launched the Super Bowl campaign, we were kind of just getting the word out, the vaccines being distributed, we support that. We are putting our resources towards supporting it because it's so important and trying to drive awareness. So we have been looking a bit at, you know, if people are exposed to the ad or not, how, how post exposure, once they have been, how do they feel about considering the vaccine? And that's that's one way in that we've been looking at, but now we're, we're starting to pivot a little bit to look more specifically at groups, not just, the country overall in terms of the vaccine spectrum, but those groups that are kind of on the fence right now, not ones who are absolutely rejecting it, but ones who are thinking, I'm not sure if I wanna go quite yet, but I think I could be convinced. And those are the ones we're kind of zeroing in on now for the next phase of this campaign, whereas our first campaign was much a much broader awareness message. And so essentially what we'll do once we continue thinking about the vaccines is there are ways for us to kind of survey these groups of people and say, okay, now that you've seen our campaign, has this shifted your consideration to go get the vaccine? So we we are actually doing that research. It was a little trickier with the Super Bowl campaigns because it was so big and so mass. Um, but in the future, we're going to be looking at specific groups to see if we were able to convince or drive some more consideration for getting the vaccine. That's very much top of mind for us is shifting those probably maybe people into a yes. Mm -hmm. I have a, a question. I think if any more questions, please put it on the, on the widget and then I can ask uh, Marisa. Um, you know, you have different brands, right? Within uh, AV and InBev. Um, I've seen a lot of brands from Europe, like, you know, Belgium, obviously. And I used to live in Europe. So, you know, I remember the, the good drinking, uh, you know, environments and days there um, at night. Um, do you, I mean, as marketing unit, um, do you have a way in which you share knowledge? Because there are definitely things that you can share around, you know, consumers and their behaviors and what's going on in the category. While, of course, you have different brands, right? And you have mm -hmm. different specific audiences that you are reaching out to, but so do you, how does that marketing unit work across different beer brands? Do you share knowledge? Some, do you do like similar type of research yeah. and data collection and, you know, like have a kind of a session together? What kind of, mm -hmm. how did, can you tell us a little bit about how you work together yeah. in the organization? Absolutely. So there's a couple different ways. So to your point, you know, AB and Bev is primarily beer brands. We have a couple wine and spirits and water, but it's primarily beer. So here in the US, you know, we have brand teams for our biggest brands. We have Budweiser team, we have the Bud Light team, we have Michelob Ultra. And what we do within the US zone is try to make sure our brand architecture and our swim lanes are extremely distinct for each of these brands or we'd all be competing against each other. So that's one way that we kind of share knowledge, but make sure we're separating out and saying, okay, I'm taking sports, you take food, whatever whatever it is for our ways in. So that's, that's kind of what happens in the US is we really try to distinguish the brand identity of each of the beer brands. Now, globally, we have three global brands at ABN Bev. It's Budweiser, Stella Artois, and Corona. Um, and so Budweiser is one of the global brands, which means we have a global brand team that kind of helps coordinate all the zones. The interesting thing about Bud is it's extremely different in the U.S. versus the rest of the world. It's more of a premium kind of aspirational brand outside the U.S. And in the U.S., it's it's core, you know, kind of on the lower end price wise, and it's associated with American heritage or a heritage brand. Um, so we do do some kind of knowledge sharing with the other zones, but because the U.S. is just so different than yep. the rest of the world, actually something we'll do is kind of work with our global team to say, okay, um, 
insert name of brand in Argentina, it's a heritage brand, it's having similar kind of issues or conflict that we're having, can we connect with them and share knowledge that way? So sometimes it's not always us knowledge sharing with you know, Budweiser China, it's us knowledge sharing with an entirely other brand that has a similar background to us in another country. And I think that's kind of the beauty of us being this huge beer company is that we have, there's ways to find other Budweiser's and other zones and we can sync up and knowledge share that way. Yeah, oh, that's really helpful. Um, thank you. I think we're almost out of time, uh, but Marisa, it's been a great pleasure um, talking to you and we got really good questions from people. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Marissa and Kyoko um, for such a, a really insightful conversation. It was so interesting to hear about your career path, Marissa, and Anheuser-Busch's plans to come back together as well as the advice both of you have received and given. So. Thank you for your time today. It was really great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks.